So um, <clears throat> the title that I gave in the abstract was Semantic Web and the New Industrial Revolution, but I felt that a lot of the other speakers have really already made any point that might go under that title. So um, I'm going to give my own little introduction for a while and leave pictures of puppies up there to uh, entertain you in the meantime. So. Um, <laughs> I told the folks at dinner I was going to do only pictures of puppies. That's actually not true. I'm only going to do it for now. So um, uh, thank you for the uh, introduction. So <clears throat> something that happens for those that this, as he said, the name of this conference, Semantic Web Applications Technologies, uh, this, when you're a technology enthusiast and you're a technology evangelist, you're doing something innovative, something that hasn't been done before. And we have some real bootstrapping problems here. You go in and you say, okay, I want to make the rubber meet the road. We're going to take it from the research lab into industry. And the first business you go to, businesses are by their very nature conservative. And they say, wow, this sounds really great. Who has done it before? How can you convince me that it's going to work? Can you show me the success stories? You say, well, not yet. You're the first one. And of all, well, <laughs> no, no, no I, uh, not not me. I'm not. I'm not the first. Someone else dance first, right? No, no, no. I'm, I'm not the first one. And so, how do you ever break into that? And then, even when you do with some sidling and uh, whatever. So, um, for instance, it could be that what happens is some very visionary managing director comes in with a strong uh, track record, and they walk in and say, "I will make your problem work. How will you do it?" Look at my record. That's how. Give me $20 million. And they go, oh, by the way, I'm using a new technology. And that's one of the ways the ice breaks. That actually happened at uh, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. But even once the ice is broken and you've got that successful story at the big bank or the big hospital or whatever, it, it's really successful and it's in production. It's given them a competitive edge over their competitors. They're not going to want you to talk about it. Hey, that's my secret sauce. You can't talk about that. And the people in this room, of course, we want to actually advance science. We want to advance the uh, nature of knowledge uh, that the human race has. And so it stays locked up. So a bit of my background in recent years, I'm a consultant that does semantic web projects for big companies. And over the years, we've managed to break through that first one. I actually have a handful of actual deployments in productions at Fortune 100 companies that are actually working, and I'm going to tell you about them. Oh, wait a minute, not exactly, because of number two. So <clears throat> as it happens, the project at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, I had a hush order. You must not talk about this. I don't want Chase to know. I don't want Citi to know. Uh, this is our special thing. Now, that was four years ago, and so that's probably faded away anyway. But about three years ago, and the date's on the slides. I forget when it is. Uh, the EDM Council, that's the Enterprise Data Management Council. It's very like FPA. It's a consortium of companies. Only the companies are banks, not pharmaceutical companies. <clears throat> well, it, um, I was working with, with FPA trying to sell FIBO, the financial industry business ontology, to a regulator in America, and they were asking that question. Has this technology behind FIBO ever been used by any of the banks to do anything real? <laughs> I'm not allowed to speak. I was gagged. And I went to the director and I said, can you go back to Merrill Lynch? Use your contacts in the C-suite. Put pressure on my former boss and get me permission. Next day, an email from my former boss. Work with your former colleague here to put together a presentation. We will approve it for general release. And you will see that presentation today. Amongst other things, you will see an, a fragment of it. I'm, I don't have much time, so I'm not going to show you the whole presentation of anything. So <clears throat> what I am going to do today, uh, Andrea asked me to not talk about life sciences. Uh, in fact, I've come here to listen. I'm not going to tell you guys anything about life sciences you don't know, but to talk about other industries. So I'm going to talk about two industries today. One is finance. That's what I'm most actively working in at the moment. But a couple of years ago, I was working in media. 
And I have the same problem with the media company that I work for, whose uh, name I won't say, but it will actually appear because the project I talk about, they were involved in. I'm going to talk about a university project at the University of Southern California, which is completely open. You're allowed to go read about it on the web. And all I'm going to say is that the, there's a media company in their list of sponsors that actually has a souped up version of that in production. But I'm only going to talk about the academic version of it today because that's what I'm allowed to talk about. All right, so let's start with a little bit of the history in finance of the last decade. And many of you will probably remember, if you've ever read or seen The Big Short, that about 10 years ago we had a bit of a crisis having to do with credit default swaps and mortgages and a bunch of stuff. And that was in 2008 that things really went awry. Well, every five years or so, there is a commission called the Basel Commission on Banking Supervision. They meet in Basel, Switzerland, every few years. That met, I think it was in 2010 when they met, but the publication came out a couple of years later, a document called BCBS, Basel Commission Banking Supervision, 239. I recommend you read it if you're interested in this stuff at all. It's a short read. Um, it's 28 pages long, but most of that is um, tables of contents and disclaimers and this page intentionally left blank. There's really only about 15 pages to it, and it goes fast. Um, th in the BCBS 239, the Basel Commission, which is a bunch of banks, said, what can we do? to regulate ourselves so that the governments don't feel like they need to come in and regulate us more. So this is a, an attempt at self-regulation, doing as little as they can to actually avert things like 2008 without tying their hands too much so they can't do business the way they'd like to. That was 2012-13. The first version came out in 2012, the second one in 2000, the final one in 2013. Now, in 2014, I was working at Bank of America. Uh, we weren't particularly aware of the BCBS work. We weren't, that wasn't high on our list. We were aware of it, but it wasn't driving the project. What was driving the project was genuine need inside the bank, and I'm going to talk about that in some detail. Now, today is 2018, and over the course of sometime even before the BCBS 239, FIBO was a gleam in the eye of some of the ontologists at the uh, EDM Council. Yes, we had ontologists there even in 2010, maybe 9. I'm not quite sure how far back that goes. But once BCBS 239 came in, then the need for an ontology really showed up. And I'm going to give you just enough about BCBS 239 to understand what that it's all about. So let's go right into it. The next few slides, I'm actually going to start in 2013, or 14, I guess it is, with a project that we did at Bank of America. I'm starting here because conceptually this is the most primitive. It doesn't use FIBO. It doesn't expect there to be a published ontology. It's not responding directly to BCBS 239. This is motivated by a problem in the bank. And the solution is a semantic web technologies solution. So, um, Cesium is the name of the project. It's a platform for reference data. Reference data means a lot of things to a lot of people. In the bank, <coughs> reference data refers to data about all of the firms that we might have business with. So if we trade in an instrument that is a, a stock or a bond over this company, the details of that company, we need to know something about that. That's our reference data. So any company that we might trade a stock over, so pretty much every company the SEC has a filing for. <clears throat> this is our single source of the data. Oh, by the way, Bank of America, a little bit about its history. I have a, an account at Bank of America. I never opened an account at Bank of America. I opened an account at a bank in Boston when I moved there back in the 90s. That bank was bought by a bank. That was bought by a bank. That was bought by a bank. That was bought by Bank of America. If each of those mergers was, was just binary, you know, do the math, that's 16 banks. And if any of them went more than binary, you've got heaven knows how many banks. Oh, by the way, that's Bank of America. They are also Merrill Lynch. By the way, Merrill Lynch's full name is Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner, and Smith, because, and so on. How many banks, brokerage firms, entities are inside of the modern Bank of America? I don't know. 
I wonder if enterprise architecture actually knows. Um, and then how many databases do those people have? And what do the regulators want us to do in terms of the right hand knowing what the left hand's doing? They want us to be perfect. There is the challenge that Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner, and Smith has to deal with. And we're talking about the reference data part of it. And he, I'm not going to go through these slides in full detail because they are a 40 minute talk in their own right. And I've only got 40 minutes, so I'm only going to do pieces of that. Okay. I call the problem that we're solving here sustainable extensibility, and you'll see why. The basic problem is one I've just described. This is entirely intramural. You folks talk a lot about sharing things between institutions, and so will I. But cesium was completely intramural, but intramural on Bank of America is a global problem, so it's still pretty big. You've got some analyst down here who knows what he's doing. He needs to get information from all of those databases. And they're probably relational databases. They might be something else, but you know, might as well think of them as that. And here's the problem. You need to do that. You could just build a data warehouse, which is what they tried and failed. Why did they fail? Because actually, out there inside of the rest of the Bank of America infrastructure, um, there's a whole bunch of other databases. And enterprise architecture doesn't even know how many are out there, what they are, what they're doing. A problem somebody else mentioned earlier today. So whatever we do, we have not done it for all the databases. There's always one we haven't seen. And that's why we're talking about extensibility. I have to extend my data warehouse, my data lake, my knowledge graph, whatever you want to call this thing, has to be extensible. And the extensibility has to keep on going. I can't just extend it once or twice. That has to be its normal operation, is extending. And that's why I call it sustainable extensibility, that we can extend it and keep going. The solution here is one that would be very familiar to everyone in this room. That is, we build a thing and on this slide I call a model. You might want to call it an ontology. That tells this fellow what, what form he expects his data to look in, so his user interfaces, his analytic tools, anything he does has an idea of what that data should look like. Then we either really or virtually turn this stuff into graphs. And then we map the schema of those things either to each other or to the ontology. And now that's how he works with his data. This um, overall top level architecture is familiar to many of the systems we've seen here already. But now here's the key. Over here on the right, you can do this incrementally, bring in a new database, virtualize it, map its schema back, and carry on. And that's something you can do piece by piece. Now, a little personal anecdote here. I was a contractor on this. I was living in California. The work was happening, for the most part, in New York City. About once every month, I would spend a week in New York City working with the team, helping them organize the ontology, helping them with the overall like vision of this, because people who haven't done graph mapping will lose sight of what they're doing here. I'm sure you've all experienced that. And it was my job to sort of keep them in line here. But after a while, I got to the amount of time that Bank of America says, look, if you've been a contractor this long, either we should hire you as a employee or you're out the door. And since I'm a consultant with, with lots of other clients, I was out the door. So my boss invited me back for one last week, basically just to go to the goodbye party. <laughs> but in that last week, I hadn't been there for like four months because you know, the project was basically done. It was going over into the people who had maintained it. I went into the directory in our Git repository where the schemas for these things were kept. When I had left, there was one that was really fleshed out. Our team had fleshed it out to figure out how do you go about doing that. And our tech writer had written up what we did as we did that. He was a really good tech writer. <clears throat> and I came back, I looked at that folder, and there were 14 of these, and five of them were fleshed out. And I went to my colleagues and said, hey, I see you've got five more data sets here. How many of those are actually working? So, well, four of them, the fifth one goes online next week. Oh, you've been very busy. He says, no, no, not me. Well, that must be Gregor sitting next to you. He's been very busy. No, 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 no. Well, who's, who, who built these? The lines of business. The lines built the mappings. The lines did this work. 
That's what you really want. We shouldn't have to be the software priests who come in and have to do all this stuff. We actually taught the lines of business to do it. He says, yeah, we had to hold their hands for the first week, but then they kind of got the hang of it and they did the rest of it themselves. Whoa, the lines did that work. And that's really important. And so that's why it was sustainable. The lines were able to do that. So um, the overall system provides a single point of access for all of this kind of data. One that I do want to draw your attention to here is this thing that we call primitives. I put it in inverted commas because it's a funny word. It's something that um, I think Tom this is certainly one of your lightweight ontologies. These are like pick lists and small vocabularies. What's, do you have a word for, for those as a category? Vocabulary might be the right word for it. Vocabulary. That's the word that I prefer for it, is controlled vocabularies. Uh, and when we get into media, we're going to call those things bizarrely authorities. <laughs> I have a funny word for them as well. And if you're a database person, you can actually figure out why they call them primitives, but I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but one of, the, um, one of the things that's particularly interesting about this architecture is the role that these things play. And this is going to come back again and again in my talk, which is why I've uh, singled this out. Okay. I've only got 45 minutes. I'm halfway through my time. Okay. Um, <laughs> then let's, so we'll move a, a bit faster on this. This is a, a picture of the whole architecture. All I'm going to draw your attention to is this paragraph that was written by the head engineer in this project. When we put together the slide set, he says, well, this is a nice slide set, Dean, but you haven't really told them why this contributed to the success of the project. And what that and he wrote this paragraph, I just lifted it from his email, basically saying, I have built any number of these systems at different banks. That's how the people in Wall Street work. It says, but in this case, all of those pieces of this system, the ingestion, the data quality, the security, the indexing, and the user interface, were all driven from the same machine-readable entity, which is this weirdo thing you call an ontology. And that is what drove all of them. Normally, this was five independent development activities, and he would coordinate them through the workflow. In this project, he coordinated through the ontology. And his statement here is, that allowed me to make this, well, first of all, quicker and more sustainable. So, in terms of a lesson learned to take from this in the role of, and there's their user interface at the end, and I could talk about all the cool stuff in there. It's kind of ugly, but that was the one that came out of the box at the very beginning. And all of the things, I, I let the engineer brag about all of his features, and they are pretty cool, but I'm not going to talk about them. But the thing to take away from here is that role of the ontology coordinated the entire engineering effort and allowed it to be repeatable. And that's what turned it into actual value. This one, this went into production, one of the slides said, I forget which, where, where that was in the slides, 2014 I think it was. So it's been in production for four years now. Where is the slide that has it on there? 14, yeah, 2014. So this sustainability comes from the fact that the ontology made all of this stuff explicit and allowed the engineers to coordinate their work. Okay. Let's move forward conceptually a little bit back in time to BCBS 239. So <clears throat> this is the uh, the Basel Commission is part of a thing called the Banking Information Society or something like that, the BIS. <clears throat> and the so the, the, the too long did not read version of BCBS 239 says you need to manage your risk data better and we're going to give you some principles for that. And the principles, they get 14 of them, here's the 11 that are actually about the data itself. The other three was this is how we're going to look over your shoulder to make sure you're doing it. But all of these things here, governance, keep track of your risk data, infrastructure, so your infrastructure works the same in a crisis as it does normally, um, accuracy and integrity. Now look at some of these things. Automatically aggregate your information together so that all of it comes in in a uniform way. Sound familiar? Completeness, we want different people to be able to look at this and all get pictures that are coherent across them. They have to come in at the same time, which is basically you have to automate the thing. Uh, we want to respond to lots of different stakeholders who are looking at our data in different ways. When you look at these are requirements, they don't tell you what technology to use. But as you read through this, and you're someone who knows about data warehousing, someone who knows about semantic web, you say, the only way I'm going to do this is if I actually have 
a introspective picture of my enterprise data. I actually have a model that tells me what's in each of these. I actually have a catalog of that. And I actually have automated ways to move my data through there. And if you don't have that, you are not going to simultaneously satisfy these 11 requirements. <clears throat> and this is what really set the EDM Council off and said, we need to encourage the banks to build these graph databases. And that's what started the third thing I'll talk about here in finance, which is FIBO, the Financial Industry Business Ontology. So FIBO was started by the EDM Council somewhere around 2010 or so. It started out as a conceptual ontology, but when BCBS 239 came in, they said, okay, this is our semantic entity that we can use to drive the industry in the direction that it needs to go to satisfy BCBS 239. And so FIBO um, really kicked up its, um, its game around that time. I joined FIBO uh, 2015, I think it was, or maybe 2014, right, right when I finished cesium, I went into FIBO. So I was a bit of a latecomer coming in around here, but really before that, FIBO was a very small team. So I sort of, I'm now an old timer, even though I uh, didn't come in at the beginning. So I'm not going to talk about, a lot about the content of FIBO. That would take a whole day course. It's five, just like you wouldn't talk about the content of the gene ontology in a setting like this. But I do want to talk a bit about its structure, because we've heard a lot about infrastructure, technology, and so on in various of the projects we've talked about this week. And so I want to uh, talk about how FIBO is structured. First of all, at starting in 2014 or 2013, the council made the decision that FIBO will be published in OWL. So that is our system of record. When we take all the various artifacts that were there before, they were done in Enterprise Architect to begin with, turn them into OWL, that is our system of record. All of our edits go back to the OWL. So that's a decision that very clearly shows where our priorities are. And it's quite the opposite decision, for instance, that Agrivoc took, where they started off in SCOS. And if they want something richer, they have to go, as it were, upstream. Tom had a lovely slide near the end of his talk yesterday about the complementary role of a SCOS-based vocabulary light ontology, as he called it, and an owl-based heavy ontology. We started at the heavy end, and we hammer a lot of logic into that. There's advantages to that and disadvantages to that. One of the disadvantages is that if you're some weird ontology person and you know how to use one of these tools, you're golden. because <laughs> yes, the, Those things work really nice with OWL and they can take advantage of all that cool logic and you can do really cool things. But what if you aren't one of those people? What if you're somebody who's using a vocabulary based tool like Calibra, Smart Logic, Pool Party, and there could be, there's actually quite a lot of other things there. What if you're one of them? Then going directly to the OWL is either pretty annoying or just completely prohibitive. So what we do in FIBO is that we actually provide a large number of derivative products. So the OWL is the only one that is normative. All the other ones are informative. That is that they, they might not really reflect what's there. The SCOS can't reflect everything that's in OWL. But if you get the SCOS version of FIBO, which we call FIBO V, that thing can be read directly into any of these tools. We generate that automatically out of our FIBO uh, OWL version every quarter. Now, you might not even be thinking about doing this with tools at all. You might just be someone who's coming up to this saying, gee, what can FIBO tell me about bonds? And you don't really want to look into a tool like Calibra, certainly not a tool like Protege. What you really want to do is just go to a web page and say, FIBO, tell me what you know about bonds. And so we produce a thing called the glossary. It shows up in HTML, so it looks like a page. It just has thousands of definitions on it and a nice little search engine at the top. Or we give it to you in Excel so you can do whatever slicing and dicing. Or one that I've been playing with. I really hate demoing this because when you demo Alexa, you never know what she's going to do. Um, <laughs> so let's give this a try. OK. Ask financial ontology what the definition of legal person is. 
Come on. Oh, I've got my volume down, darn it. I can see the answer here. Let's do it again. Ask financial ontology what the definition of legal person is. No, she doesn't do it. OK. <laughs> Ask financial ontology what the definition of legal person is. A legal person is any entity which can incur a legal obligation and can be sued at law. Okay, so that's the FIBO definition of that. What kinds of interest rate swap are there? There are no known subclasses of interest rates. Awesome. <laughs> what kinds of interest rate swap are there? The types of interest rate swap are cross-currency interest rate swap, fixed float interest rate swap, float float interest rate swap, and single currency interest rate swap. What is the definition of single currency interest rate swap? A single currency interest rate swap is an interest rate swap in which the two streams of interest payments are in the same currency. Okay, that was a bit obvious, but you get the idea there. <clears throat> and the way that works is the Alexa skill goes off to a Sparkle endpoint that goes into FIBO and gets all that stuff out again. And this is typical of Alexa apps. It's you know, got its issues. That worked perfectly in my hotel room. Honest, it did. Um, <laughs> So one of the things that we're doing is trying to figure out how to make FIBO accessible to a broad range of audiences. And that one's not an official product of the council yet. I'm trying to figure out how I want to personally market that. But um, it gives you an idea of what you can actually do. So um, let's see. <clears throat> For use cases around FIBO, um, we were, we were discussing this the other day, and a student here at Antwerp, actually, who's in the audience right now, asked our director for a list of use cases. I actually added a couple to this, well, I had one to it. And here's a few use cases. I don't have time to go through them in detail, but you'll see a few things that are similar, or that are familiar here. This data integration, that's the one we did at Cesium. Um, data harmonization is one where, we're, he's talking about meaning, not words. Google calls that things, not strings. And that's where we bring in controlled vocabularies rather than their strings. Meta had a great example that she had that spreadsheet where the same thing was represented in a bazillion different ways and she wanted to normalize that down. That's what number one is here. And then number six is one that I added and I'm calling it enterprise data rationalization. This one I'm seeing in one of my clients right now. You go to a database. He actually, uh, my, my uh, sponsor did this the other day. He was in an enterprise architect meeting with his CDO, and he made a comment about table number 26 of one of their co corporate databases. And the CDO said, I'm sorry, I don't remember what table number 26 is. And he says, of course you don't. Nobody does. Let me show you. And then he got this fabulous d display, which I can only describe and not show you, of all the table names in table number 26. And then a tree over top of them where it says, well, actually, these five are an address. And those five are an address. That one is the headquarters address. That one is the mailing address. These things are the LEI. Well, the LEI actually has to connect off to the Goliath that controls LEIs. This one, and he he laid out all of this and had a tree that went up, and at the top of the tree were concepts and FIBO. So he could actually compare this to other tables inside of his organization, or if you're the SEC or the CFTC or one of these regulators, you could do that across uh, banks. And that, of course, is the holy grail of FIBO, is that the regulators can now look at some complex multi-agency instrument like a credit default swap and actually figure out where the apples are, are compared to apples and where oranges are compared to oranges. That's what we're really trying to do at an industry level. And this is a picture of how he's doing it inside. And of course, the whole way this is going to happen, we've got to make it worthwhile for the banks to do this inside themselves so that we can get the big picture of bringing it all together. This is a rhythm we've seen several times here where we have to have incremental value in order to get people engaged. But the people in this room, we're all the visionaries. We see the big value that's going to happen when they all do it. All right. Let's see. Oh, man. <laughs> I did start five minutes late, right? Um, so I can have five extra minutes here. I do want to talk about another industry. So finance is where I'm working right now. It's where I have my most current information. But up until about a year ago, I was working for a large media company. 
They make movies, television shows. They also have theme parks. They have merchandise. They have Broadway shows. Um, they have all sorts of things like that. Their name is on this slide, but because they're working for a different project here. So uh, I'm not going to confirm or deny that I'm working for any company on this slide. Now, Disney, the US, the University of Southern California, and Mark Logic did a project a couple years ago that is in the public domain. The work I have done for my media company is not in the public domain, and I cannot talk about it. But I will talk about the suitcase project, which the Disney ABC television group and the ETC and Mark Logic did together about two years ago, I think it was. So the idea of the suitcase, it's a short film. Um, I'm not sure if you can watch it. I can because they gave me the secret password to it. And that's why I'm not using my laptop. I'm going to show you an excerpt from it. Um, but I have a little warning there. Do not distribute this, this URL. So that's why it's on my laptop. So the suitcase is a short film, about 20 minutes long. And the University of Southern California were interested in the problem that you have in the production of a movie that you start at the very beginning with the creatives coming up with ideas, they come up with plot lines, they come up with creative things, and they have scripts, they could do some casting. Then you start to film, you go on location, you start to edit, you start to do the sound editing, and way down here, you kind of forget what was supposed to be happening way at the beginning. And the, the workflow data management is actually pretty complicated because there's an awful lot of different kinds of folks who get involved in the movie making process. And so their thesis is it ought to be possible to have a movie making data cloud and that's, uh, you'll see in, the, in their slides what that's all about, that will allow you to manage this data from end to end. What technology ought we to use for that? And Mark Logic stepped in. Mark Logic has, had recently produced their RDF store, um, and they came in and said, we think that RDF is a good technology for this. And they uh, brought in a couple of consultants from uh, various places and a few people who were working for the Disney ABC television group, which may or may not have included me. Um, and they produced this little... <coughs> I'm not going to go through this entire talk either. Um, just quickly, C4, that's their data management. So it's the Cinema Content Creation Cloud. And that's this data management thing that goes from end to end for producing a movie. The part I want to draw your attention to is this slide and their workflow, where you start with a thing they call ontology creation, where you actually talk about what are the things we're going to be managing in here. So what are some of those things? There are the characters in a story. There are the actors who are playing those characters, maybe or maybe not in one-to-one -one correspondence. Think Anakin Skywalker or Darren from Bewitched. Uh, how do the reels of film correspond to the script? How does the script correspond to the title? And so on. It's actually a pretty elaborate system in media for that. Controlled vocabulary and authority list definition. This is the things that we called primitives before that Tom called lightweight ontologies that I, that I call vocabularies or pick lists. And here, some of them come out of their database, the list of characters, the list of actors. Others are the things the researchers are interested in. Storylines. What kind of conflict can two characters have? Because they actually want to do an analysis. They would like to actually say, can you show me all the scenes where Amanda is in a fight with another character? That's the kind of query they want to be able to do across this. So you need to know what kinds of relationships can characters be in. Can you show me scenes where Amanda is in love with another character? Can you show me scenes where Amanda has regret? So that's the kind of thing they want to be able to do. Then this is the fun part, temporal annotation. Good work if you can get it. They have hired several people, actually I think several hundred, to watch the movie. And they stop it and they say, ah, look, Amanda is having a fight with Charles. Ah, look. And they annotate things about the characters, things about what's happening in the plot, things what's happening in the character development. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. 
<clears throat> then you do the data integration, integrate all this stuff together that we just talked about, query construction. This is where you would bring in an engineer who's very good at Sparkle and is able to look at an ontology and craft Sparkle queries out of that in a second. Um, somebody at Disney ABC, one of their consultants, was very good at that and so did all that work for them. And then you build an application on top of that. So now this whole architecture, one of the media groups involved with this has a version of this in production. They are actually doing, uh, there are now hundreds of television shows that if you watch them here, you actually are uh, watching things that have been annotated by professional television watchers and they can cross-reference stuff that way. Isn't that cool? <laughs> So, the kinds of applications, I will let your imagination run wild with what a media group like this could do with that kind of data, but it's going to be search, retrieve video content based upon granular facets like the examples I gave earlier, analytics, find out, oh, the tweet stream is coming in, what was popular, what, and how do this, can we predict the popularity of something based upon these features. And then product development, the sorts of things we market, new creative works and so on. How do we use this information to guide our creative process in the future? So that's the sort of thing that we're doing in media with this. Again, it's all intramural, but it's intramural in a very complex space where we have information about a lot of different things all coming together. So I'm going to give a quick Yeah, so I, I asked that question, and they said, oh, I see you've never actually been involved in movie production, have you? <laughs> and that's what they said to me. Um, yeah, that's how you start. By the time it gets to the end, the screenplay feels like it was a suggestion. Yeah, I was un unaware of this as well. Um, that, yeah, that's how you start. And by the time you get from here where the creators thought about this, to here where they wrote that screenplay, to here where the actors did it, to the cinema where you and I see this, and I chose my step size appropriately. Um, I'm not telling this from, from, from first-hand knowledge. I, I don't know that. But that's what I was told when I asked the same question. So, um, no, they did not make me feel as much of a fool as I've just done to you. But <laughs> um, so just as a quick, this is an excerpt from the suitcase. And I'll just, I, we're somewhere in the middle of some scene here. So the fellow's come into his boss's office to ask for an advance on his bonus. And his boss is going to say no, but in a sweet way. So if we stop this, we see the characters that are here are Joe Frannick and Donald Timothy. Um, we know from earlier ones that this is our main character and that's his boss. But what's going on here, the location is Timothy's office, which is at Logan International Airport. The whole thing takes place in Boston. And now here's what I find interesting. There's a whole theme going through, and this actually uh, goes right to your question, Chris. There's a whole theme in this part of the show that Joe dreams of becoming a pilot. He's actually a baggage handler at the airport. And he, would, you know, he really wishes he were one of the cool people <coughs> of becoming a pilot. If you watch this scene, you have no idea at all that during this part of the show, the creatives were thinking of developing Joe's character and his wish. Because basically, this is part of a part of a part of something. And this scene itself, I would never have known that. <laughs> you know, yes, just before this, he snuck into the cockpit and had a little fantasy and you know, had a quick Top Gun sort of uh, you know, montage. And then he, then he was snapped back into reality when his buddy said, hey, we got to move the suitcase. Get yourself back on the floor. Um, and this is on his way back from the floor. He's now talking to his boss about his salary problems. Well, it all fits in together, but I wouldn't have known that. That's what the creatives had in mind. And that's, that's why they can't just be the screenplay, right? That there's these connections of things that aren't there anymore. And they were also developing their relationship. So <clears throat> the, the controlled vocabularies are really important here. And I'm reminded as I look at this, well, actually, I'm reminded the other way around. When I see the folks at the CG talk about their spreadsheets, and there's one that Elizabeth did at a meeting, not this meeting, but the last one that I saw the CG folks at. She has a, but it was very similar to what Meta had. You have a spreadsheet, and there's a column in the spreadsheet that's called, you know, let's say eye color. 
and you've got some strings there. B R B L G R H Z, something like that. I'm talking about human eye color now just because it's familiar. And anyone who knows the phenotype of Homo sapiens can guess that I just said brown, blue, green, and hazel. Um, well, if you knew those phenotypes, you could do that. How do you go about taking those strings and mapping them to the things? How do you figure out that the things that you map them to are the same things as they map them to? One way of looking at what's happening here in the suitcase is that what we're really managing is a whole bunch of itty-bitty controlled vocabularies and making sure we know when we're going to use which one. And in the example of the phenotypes in the uh, crop data that Meta and Elizabeth and the CG folks have, that's the same sort of thing if you get into a phenotype list. Whose job is it to coordinate, in the case of agriculture, the thousands of little teeny tiny vocabularies? Here in media, at least inside of the media group who's doing these things, we actually have one person who has, is, is, the, is sort of the, the brain master of all this, and she keeps track of this, and there are probably over a hundred of these little vocabularies, and she has designed each one herself because she's the one doing the research. That's quite manageable. <clears throat> the challenge I see for this community is how do you do that in a distributed way? And so here we're seeing how does that become production value inside of a media company, and then in the big picture, how does that become something that we use to organize an industry? So I've actually had come pretty much to the end of my time. I have a little conclusion I'd like to talk about. And it's not so much me telling you things in conclusion as me asking you some things, a little bit of both. Um, well, actually, let's go back one. Which one's on there? There we go. So <clears throat> during this meeting, I'm finding myself thinking in pretty much every talk I sit in, how is whatever I'm seeing up here, similar or different to these production systems that are happening in these big companies. Now, production systems in big companies tend to be very narrow and focused on one thing. They're not cool research things that have lots of cutting edge stuff. Or as my buddy Jeff Pollack used to say, Boring problems make money. Uh, these problems are way more boring than a lot of the ones that I'm seeing out here. But you know, today's research is tomorrow's boring pro problem, right? So <laughs> this is how that goes. But a couple of things that I'm noticing here is that how many people in the room would consider yourself a scientist by what you do? Yeah. Almost, wow, I think it's actually every hand went up. Uh, yours didn't. <laughs> that was the only one. And Tom, I don't think you raised your hand, right? So, but pretty much everyone else raised their hand. And if I were to do that in the bank or in the media company, if I got one, <laughs> it would be surprising, right? So you're scientists, and this is what we were talking about during the coffee break. You have a different relationship to data than the ordinary person does. First of all, you have the whole idea of an experimental method where data plays various roles. <clears throat> um, you have a publisher, many of you have a publisher parish mandate. You actually have to take your data or your conclusions, publish them, get them into a place where people actually want to share them. Here, it's pretty much the opposite, publish and perish. Bank of America will not allow me to tell Chase what I'm doing, not until four years later. <coughs> the media company I keep referring to won't even allow me to say that they're doing this, even though their name is on this, um, this public project, and so you could probably figure it out. <coughs> yeah, they're holding their cards close to their chest. They are not publishing this information. That is lifeblood to them. Um, and so you guys are willing to think hard about your data and metadata. So as just sort of the end of this talk, so I'm starting to put together this little chart here, and you see there's a lot of holes in it. But as I listen to you talk about data, and I start thinking about, because you're more sophisticated about data than my customers are, um, distinctions I'm seeing that you have that, well, how do they show up in them? So I've come up with um, what seems to be six one, two, three, four, five, six. D completely different ways of thinking about data. And not surprisingly, you guys have, well, there's one down there I'm not quite sure about. Um, you know, everybody has some part of this. And I'd like to go through it really quickly. <coughs> images. This is really big in media. And by images, I mean videos. And for you in agriculture, that's been really big as well, because you do your satellite images, as well as folks who are doing clinical stuff. If you do an image of a 
broken bone. I broke my ankle last conference. I saw Mark Musin at. <laughs> he saw that coming. Um, or you know, x-rays or all sorts of other image things you might do. In finance, as far as I can tell, we don't do anything with images. I mean, yeah, print, print outs of checks, but that's not the same sort of thing at all. Um, streaming data. In agriculture especially, you send those drones out and you find out every day what's, or, the, or the satellite images, what's the pH of the soil, um, is there a sign of this fungus attacking this leaf. You get this kind of data, clinical data, what's this patient's temperature as you're going through the day and so on. In finance, we have um, uh, the transactions, the offers for uh, sale, which sets the prices. So we get this sort of data that's coming in in a streaming, maybe even multiple times per second. How do we treat that in comparison to things like the stuff we actually measure? You know, you guys set up experiments and you take measurements. And we, I heard someone yesterday say, uh, or was it yesterday? We need to make sure that when somebody publishes their paper that they put the data into a vault so that other people can replicate their results. Yeah, the, now that by data there, you mean the measurements that they took when they did their experiment. Um, I don't know that we have anything corresponding to that in finance. And the closest thing I can think of to that in media are those professional TV watchers, and that's actually kind of weird. <laughs> you know, if it weren't for this project, I don't think there's anything quite like that. Yeah, yeah. Oh. To make use of the um, the subtitles that stream, yes, when well, you that, and, and then and, pull and that and through. And that's another question: Why aren't we using that? And actually, we did start using that after we got the streams that had it in there. But then the uh, and the subtitles are different kinds: of the translated ones, and there's the um, the um, closed captions for the deaf. And that's one of those many sources of data that has to come back in at the end there. Yeah. Um, then the thing that almost everyone in this room keeps talking about this week is what I, this, this line here. You actually come to a conclusion. Aspirin inhibits the production of this enzyme. You came to that conclusion by looking at lots of data and you published it. And that becomes a nano publication or an assertion. And that's hardly what we ever talk about in these other things. We do have it. That's like this market data where we draw some conclusion about the market. Or in finance, there's a whole subfield, the ratings. You know, what, what, what does Bloomberg or Reuters do? They look at this stuff and they say, you're, you're, you're a double A. And in fact, that's where the failing happened in 2008. It was right in this square because we didn't have what you guys have, which is a peer review. <laughs> so it just crashed. Then you have this data that I've been calling vocabulary that Tom called light ontologies that they called authorities in the media one that we called primitives at cesium. And this is one that I find particularly interesting, and I think Tom does as well, which I was kind of focusing on it in his talk. This is where you actually sit down and say, what are the choices I have when I'm talking about a character in a show, or the kinds of conflicts that characters can have. Or in the case of the banks, LCC, that's called Languages, Countries, and Codes. That's lists of languages, list of countries, list of currencies, list of the requirements that Dodd-Frank places upon us, lists of the ratings that Finch will do for us, and so on. <clears throat> this is how you organize what the scope of our knowledge is in all those little places. And for you, good God, you got all sorts of stuff, phenotype, snowmed, I mean, that, that list goes on forever in, in your domain. And now here's what I find really funny, though. This, at the schema level, the work I do in FIBO is all, all of it, and I've argued that more of it should be up here, but almost all of it is here. I talk about what is the structure of an interest rate swap. An interest rate swap has two legs. Well, the leg could either be fixed or float. If it is fixed, then it has a fixed interest rate, which is made up of. If it's float, then it's made up of something else. And I will tell you what it's made up of. I don't give you anything about any particular swap contract. That's, that's the data. I'm doing pure schema. But that means if you bring a swap contract in and you say it's a fixed float swap and you've got a reference rate on, on both of your legs, they'll say that's not fixed float, that's float float. Because you've got a reference rate and only floats have reference rates. It tells me what to expect and what has to be there. And I don't see, and we, you see it a lot in the media as well, this thing called IDER. It's kind of like Isbens for movies. But it's broken down into basically an ontology for what is the thing you're representing. And I see very little action 
hear about schemas. They're all, they seem always to be in the background. I never hear anyone say, well, the relationship of a disease to a therapy or of a symptom to a pathway or of, I know that information's back there, that schematic information of the relationships between drugs and pathways, pathways and symptoms, symptoms and diseases, diseases and therapies, drugs and therapies. I know that's all out there, but I, I rarely see anyone put a diagram up here of, I'm not sure what I would call it, the meta-ontology of open facts. I know they have it. It's, it's what structures the API. But it wasn't machine readable. It wasn't published. And I don't, I'm not saying they don't exist, but it's not something that this group talks about a lot. Yeah, Andrea. Maybe, maybe they're very fragmented atoms, right? But there was at some point the relational ontology, SIO. There are yeah. different data models in different areas. Yeah. Maybe there is not a unique take. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, I may, that makes me ask the question, why, why not? In finance, this is obviously the focus, whereas in here, it has to exist. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like you say, they're there, but it's not what we ever talk about. Is it just easier in life sciences? I find that unlikely. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think it, it does exist. It's maybe a bit hidden. Uh, I, I recognize this in the life sciences as we don't talk about semantic web because people don't uh, like that. Uh, I, I do see plenty of it here at this conference. And for open facts uh, specifically, I don't think uh, at any point any such thing was developed at all. Uh, uh, that was never the intention. We want the, the idea there was to, to uh, be uh, flexible in adopting uh, uh, using new data sets. And um, the closest thing there, I think, is the scientific lenses. Uh, lenses there. Yeah. Uh, another project that I r uh, recently did for uh, nano safety. This was a core thing, and I've seen plenty of other articles really describing uh, this is how we need to integrate these ontologies to capture this field. Um, but I think uh, may may maybe it's just that. Uh, uh, the life scientists that are not using these technologies don't want to see the tautologies, or that perception at least. I so I finished this talk in an odd way that I asked a question to the audience. So um, <laughs> I, I'm interested to hear these answers. Go ahead, Andre. I think maybe another reason is that uh, in many areas of life science, uh, coding scheme we are present since a lot of time, right? So ontologies kind of evolved from this. If you take ICD, this kind of stuff was existing independently from the model. Yeah, to code disease for statistical analysis. So you got this bag of terminology coming from history and predating any modeling in a sense. So, so in some sense it's embedded in the culture, so you don't need to make it explicit. Exactly. Course, so what the terminology is there. Yeah, yeah. When we talk about semantics writ large, not just semantic web, part of the whole idea of semantics is that we're making our semantics into something we can talk about, something that's actually machine readable, a thing that is a thing we can point to. And it's interesting that how how central that is in these two industries and how, I, I, it's not that it doesn't exist, but it's not central to the way that we, we do our work here. So I think I've got to the end of my time. So I've finished my talk by asking you a question. I don't know if we have time for them to ask me questions. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's up to you, Scott. Well, let's, let's thank you. Thank you very much. So maybe just uh, if there are any burning questions. Um, okay. Ah. So, uh, despite I work in this life science field, um, I happen to have some work experience with FIBO, and uh, it is incredibly complex and complicated. So, I was wondering if you have instruments to uh, make the end users. Uh, especially non-expert in this semantic stuff, ontologies, whatever, uh, to, to make them use them. So that, that's probably the most commonly asked question about FIBO, and not just by people outside of FIBO like yourself. Every one of us who's joined the FIBO team has asked that question when we came in, because from the get-go, FIBO was built in this way that makes it very complicated. I've, I've taken recently to saying that FIBO has a birth defect. Uh, it started off as this great big enterprise architect, um, they don't call them ontologies, but I'm not sure what they call them, but a big model done in EA. And then 
we tried to bring it down into OWL, and that's created the monster that you're describing. So <laughs> a couple of answers to that. One is every one of the derivative products that I've shown is an attempt to answer that. So some people say, I just want to look up the terms. That's why I have Alexa there. I just want to be able to see it in a spreadsheet. That's why I have a spreadsheet, and so on. Now, none of those has actually satisfied people like you, nor myself for that matter. So we, we have not yet succeeded. So one that I'm working on right now, and in fact, bizarrely, that's what uh, Carlos is sitting here in the third row. He's a student here in Antwerp. By bizarrely, bizarre coincidence, he wrote to the FIBO team three weeks ago, yeah, saying that he, he wants to do a dissertation on well, with, he's still working it out, but basically ontology workflow management, let's call it. I mean, you, you can figure out what it really is. And I went to his professor's office yesterday and had a meeting with the three of them and presented that problem, because after all, that is the most commonly asked question. And one approach to this would be to say, you know what, let's not even look at FIBO. Let's look at the excerpt of FIBO you're interested in. So you're interested in, let's say, bonds. Let's start with bond, look up bond in FIBO, find all of the dependencies that are genuine dependencies in, in FIBO, on, on, uh, that bonds have in FIBO, and give you a little bonds ontology from FIBO that isn't that huge monster that you load into protege or top rate or whatever your favorite poison is, <clears throat> and you just get the bonds ontology. And the example that I gave to Carlos yesterday is the financial dates ontology. Dates should be pretty simple, right? You've got calendars, you've got appointments, you've got intervals, you've got, um, there's a couple more, but now it's not a whole lot. In FIBO today, if you load FIBO dates into protege or top raid, you're going to get contract counterparty in your ontology. Why? Well, we went through the answer to why, and I have a little program that I think will fix that in a kind of haphazard way. What Carlos may do is his research is figure out a systematic way to do that. But that's another approach we're taking. So there isn't, but basically that, that is the $25 million question, and we're trying to answer it. If you have any suggestions for us, please either tell me during a coffee break or write to the council. But it's a hard problem. I, I, I'm not able to hear you. No, the, the only suggestion, which is maybe silly, is that at the time when I needed it, I, I simply made a much simpler model, a uh, small on, owl ontology, and aligned it, mapped it to so fiber. It yeah. So that, it's interesting. So what he said is that in, in his actual work, he wrote the ontology that he needed and aligned it to FIBO, which is certainly something that we will recommend to people to do, but not very many folks at the banks have the sophistication to do that. Um, it's interesting that you do, because that shows that it actually is possible for an outsider to do it. I mean, that's obviously a, a good approach, right? And we, we talk about that all the time, that you know what? You could even take your own database, your own data warehouse, map it back to FIBO, and do it the way you like. You know, that's what I did in Cesium. That was before FIBO existed. It's good to know that you can do that, but it does take a certain kind of sophisticated person to do that. Um, some of the ontology providers have SLIMs. So, SLIMs. Yeah, so they, they tend to be parts of a whole ontology, and usually that's been driven by a particular application that they've committed to support. I know Emberly BI for EFO do that kind of thing to support open targets, platform. Um, SLIMs can be quite useful, apparently. So I'll, I'll have to talk to you about, uh, about how, what's, what sort of methodologies are available for that. Because you know, the things we've done so far haven't worked, so I'm willing to, to try new stuff. So, um, yeah. yeah. And if it's worked for EBI, then I'm definitely willing to do that. Yeah. All right. Uh, great. Oh, wow, it's was really loud. Um, did, have you come across, uh, you know, so when I think about y y your work with the, the media is fascinating, and I, I definitely want to talk to you more about that uh, at the break. Um, but it's, it's actually very similar to ways that we're in, in, in envisioning, I think, and, and this is one of my questions, but uh, to, to what we're thinking about food in terms of being useful for creatives to actually assist 
in the creation process, oh. in the creative process, <laughs> uh, leveraging ontologies to help you come up with ideas to actually create new types of data. Have, did you come across the use of the, the, the ontology and, and combined media to actually say, you know, I'm interested in taking a character like this and having a storing line like yeah. X and, and actually creating a new piece of something in the same way that I would, you know, make a new recipe or I would, you know, pull together different pieces pieces from different things and, and actually be able to predict outcomes, maybe maybe even throw in different kinds of storyline trajectories for characters and, yeah. and have outcomes, something like that. So, so that part of the business, um, I, I, I don't have visibility into and if I did, I would not be able to share it with you. But <laughs> uh, early on in this project, we were talking about the various use cases, every, every lay person in the room came up with that and the Disney employees, I'm sorry, the media company employees, oops. Um, <laughs> the media company employees all said, well, we might manage to do that, but for the most part, creatives don't work that way. Um, and they resist anybody coming in and telling them how to yeah. do their job. Now, you and I see this as giving them more tools to do their job in more and creative ways. They see it as a bunch of geeks telling them how to do their jobs who don't know what's going on. In food, that could very well be different. So, um, yeah, yeah. That, that's certainly a use case that we've thought about. As far as I know, that hasn't happened. But even if, it, but actually, this it, it is true. Even if it had, I wouldn't be allowed to know about it. Right, right. Okay, so, uh, but yeah, I think it's a fabulous idea. I mean, to my mind, when I look at this stuff, it's like, well, yeah, <laughs> that's what you want to be doing. Yeah. Yeah. So, I have experience across different industries. Is there a difference between industry which are about aggregating data produced elsewhere, like let's say life science is observational, right? Mm -hmm. We collect data and maybe some other industry where you actually are building your data, like finance, you construct financial products, right? Mm -hmm. So something where is uh, you don't observe things that you a priori don't know what they are completely, yeah? And something that you define. Is there a difference in the way you approach semantic web? in the two aspects? Yeah, so I hadn't thought of it along those lines. But you see, that's exactly the kind of thing I'm trying to sort out in this chart, just to figure out you know, what are the different ways that we do that. And I'm thinking that, so, so the question here, as I'm understanding it, is that he's proposing that there's almost a synthetic versus analytic, I might call it, uh, distinction here, that, um, or maybe discovery versus construction or something like that. So I guess analytic would be discovery and synthetic is creation. So what I see a scientific field like healthcare, like life sciences, like like um, uh, agriculture, there is some, out, some phenomenon out there that you are studying, and so that's imposing some structure on you. Whereas in both of these, we, are, we have creatives who are building the things in the left column. We have engineers who are engineering the stuff in the middle column, and so it's really very synthetic. And so I'm hearing your question being, is there a difference in how we treat semantics? And I'm, I love the way you asked that question, because I think you may be onto something. I think the answer is yes, and that's kind of why I started to build this chart. Because when I sit in this room with the scientists, you know, especially this row here, isn't something that we do in our synthetic worlds, and very little. I mean, this is kind of where we turn the synthetic on the side, and I had to struggle to fill this cell anyway. And here I failed to fill the cell. And over here, this is probably the oldest part of what you do. If you think of a, of a stodgy old person, you know, someone who's about to retire from Monsanto, this is probably the stuff that they did when they, were, when they got their degree, right? That's the oldest part of your field. And I'm thinking that the answer is yes, and a couple of the symptoms of it are an emphasis on row three in science and complete abandonment of row three in the synthetic things. And then row six, notice how it swaps around. In row six, yeah, you've got a row six, but nobody talks about it. And over here, we spent all of our time in row six. And I'm thinking that you might have put your, your finger on the distinction that causes that. Because in the synthetic stuff, we do want to be, we're being engineers. And row six is an engineering thing to do, isn't it? And here, you're being scientists, and row three is a scientific thing to do. I don't know, what do you think? Does that make sense? But I think the answer to your question is yes, I think you're, I think you're onto something. Give him the, the mic. Give him the mic. Otherwise, we're going to have... I was having that discussion uh, uh, last last week about engineering versus science, and oh. for me, an ontology is very close to science, actually, yeah. because we're actually expressing what our observations are of mm -hmm. what we see. Mm -hmm. 
That sounds like science to me, not engineering. Yeah. The difference is, imagine you are describing a, a car part, yeah? You know exactly what it is. You are constructing it. It's not going to change meaning, right? You're defining an engine, you know what it is. I think I'm meeting in a panel now. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, so, 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 the, 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 the microphone's there. I'm sorry? Oh, right, 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 right. Speaking of panels, yeah. Okay. So, so in the, uh, the in our, in our mapper project, where we have been doing a lot of uh, ontology work, uh, most of the work was really about what the hell are we talking about? We have no ID, and it changed every three months. Uh -huh. um, uh, so, I don't think ontology definition is a static thing. It was definitely there a work of progress. It was doing doing and trying to understand what uh, what what the biology was telling us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so we're now having our panel session on engineering versus science, synthetic versus analytic ontologies. Well, uh, <laughs> so, by the way, while, while we're going, we're having a panel later on today. We're going to use some panel software. Please make a note of this URL, and Andrea will tell us how to use it in the closing panel at the end of the day. Right? Okay. So, yeah. A, a, a quick point that I wanted to make is the uh, ontologies are dynamics, dynamic I got you held. entities anyway, and one of the motivations as to why you need an ontologies mapping service mm -hmm. is when the source ontologies are changing, then your mappings start to no. entropy, you know. <laughs> and, and we know up. that they change, your FIBO is always in flux, and so are the, the biological. Okay. I, 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 there's someone in the back here who really had, wants to, to make a comment. Can, uh, Scott, can you send the uh, mic, mic back to him? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there. There he is, yeah, not all the way to the back, just there, yeah. Ah! Your, your, the comments on the structure, uh, you know, FIBO versus uh, science is particularly interesting if you ever followed uh, the history of HL7 and Barry Smith's uh, uh, scarabic uh, comments thereon. Okay. Uh, HL7 ran into an interesting situation because their original domain of discourse, their original model, was data interchanged between healthcare systems. Uh -huh. And so they build an ontology about what was in data they they built and then they shifted and without even realizing shifted over to an ontology of what healthcare data is about uh -huh. and they got the two of those conflated in one model uh, which i'm sure that went really well yeah well uh, if it's fun to still read uh, yeah. uh, barry smith's uh, health watch blog uh, mm -hmm. when the two got muddled together you know yeah. uh, a, a, a patient is a record that does the following things. Right. Yeah. And so are you modeling the data or are you modeling the world that the data is about? And of course the data is also modeling the world and, and, and so on. Yeah. Indeed. One, yeah. That's the problem with the ontology word mm -hmm. is that it's not clear whether we're talking about patients or about Right. Patients. And that's especially true to my mind in life sciences. I see it a lot more here than I do in finance or media. So something that I often find kind of puzzling when I walk into a life science room. I'll look at something like Kebby. Kebby is called an ontology and it's got assertions in it like glyphosate has a phosphate group. That sounds to me like an assertion about the world, not about data. And in FIBO, when I say an interest rate swap has two legs and a flick, fixed float one has one of those that's fixed and one of them that's float, and the float one has a reference rate and the fixed one does not, there I'm talking about schema stuff. I'm talking about the data records. And I find it puzzling, I guess, when I walk into a room like this and someone stands up here and they give a talk about an ontology. You can often go for about 20 minutes before you figure out which one they're doing. And, and that makes it very difficult as someone who's listening to a paper to understand what's the right way to interpret that paper. And if you keep that confusion going on all the way through the standard as you described in the history of HL7, and I do not, will not gainsay you at all, you know a lot more about that than probably anyone on earth, <laughs> then um, yeah, that's going to be a serious problem. In FIBO, we're really pretty lucky. We never have a real contract in front of us, and we never are going to actually talk about the con content of the thing. We live entirely in the schema world, and we know it, and there's just no confusion about it. And that's why I wrote that, that, that row six. Whereas here, I often see this fuzziness slithering up and down that, and that's why I drew that diagram, is to start, or that table, is to start for myself. I mean, I'm, I have no idea if it's a service to the room, but for my own, my own sanity to keep this straight. And there was, um, 
a talk the other day, I forget who was doing it, about um, an experiment. And she was modeling experiments in RDF and slithering back and forth from um, Jupiter into a queryable representation of the experiment. That's awesome. And I'm thinking, but when I think of experiment design, I think of I'm going to take a plant and I'm going to spray glyphosate on it. I'm going to take the same plant and I'm going to spray water on it. And I'm going to put sun on it. I'm going to measure it. And I don't see how you do that in Jupiter. And I, okay, what, what, what experiment is she talking about? And it's not that she's not talking about an experiment, but you have a data science experiment versus a life science experiment. Oh boy, um, one can get oneself quite confused sitting in this audience uh, if one doesn't pay close attention. 